morning to those of you on the West Coast, good afternoon to those of you joining us from the East Coast, and good evening to anyone joining us from Europe or stations further east. Thank you for joining this, the 25th of our regular series of seminars on pumping topics. And welcome back after the summer break. I'm delighted to say that there are 505, 505 people registered for today's two sessions. That was 263 this morning and 242 this afternoon. So thank you for that. This session will last about 40 minutes and as usual, will allow time for a Q&A session after the presentation. So let me just restart the uh, screen share. Well, here is a listing of the previous short courses we've run during the last year. If you've missed any of them, you can get a copy of the materials from our website. Use the following link, shortcourses.ruhrpumpen.com, or go to www.ruhrpumpen.com and follow the link to RP Short Courses. If you go to ruhrpumpen.com, you get to this screen. And here is the link to the short courses. If you click on that link, it takes you to this page, which you can also access directly by this link, shortcourses.ruhrpumpen.com. You'll see all the courses listed and you can click on any one of them to download the course material or um, yeah, the course materials. The most recent of the previous 24 courses are, are up there. You'll also see, notice today at the bottom of the screen, I've turned on um, subtitles. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how, how well that works. Um, I do it particularly for those of you for whom English is a second language, and particularly those of you to whom uh, they've, they've learned American English rather than English English, and therefore maybe find my accent a little bit funny. Certainly, the subtitles program within PowerPoint finds it a bit funny because when I say Ruhr pumping, it says either rope pumping or grow pumpkin or roll album or royal pumpkin or raw pumpkin or Real Pumpkin, and even Royal Hampton. So I think uh, it needs to have some, some work doing on my, on my accent. Well, here is what we're going to cover today, magnetic drive pumps. It's a dark art to many pump engineers. I will try to bring it to the light. Here is what we'll cover. What is a mag drive? Why choose a mag drive? How does a mag drive work? Features and benefits, and the industrial standards that apply to a mag drive pump. And finally, as usual, we'll hold a Q&A session at the end. So please use the Q&A facility at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions or make any comments. I'll address those that I can live at the end of the session and the rest will address by mail in the coming days. We are recording this session and we'll make it available to all attendees as a YouTube link, as well as by emailing you a PDF version of the slideshow, complete with the presenter notes, which is essentially the script of the presentation. You'll also receive the Q&A summary from both of today's sessions. So first, what is a magnetic drive? Well, the key points of a magnetic drive pump are that the liquid is fully contained within the containment shell. The drive and driven ends are completely separated from the process fluid. There's the containment shell, there's the drive shaft, 
and there's the driven shaft, completely separated. There are no dynamic seals. There are static seals and O-rings, but no mechanical seals. So in that sense, it's a sealless pump. And here in these two cutaway drawings, we see the fundamental differences between the two. On the left, the magnetic drive pump, we have the magnetic coupling, we have the containment shell, we have an internal bearings and lubrication system. So thrust is intrinsically balanced internally. And we have no leakage. On the right, we have the mechanically sealed pump. So we have a mechanical seal here. You have an external seal support system, plan 52, plan 53, that sort of thing. You have external bearings, which take the radial and thrust loads. You have a longer shaft and higher loads, and hence shaft deflections to consider. And you have leakage past the seal. Now from the 40,000 foot view, they look initially the same. In both cases, you have a motor, a coupling, a coupling guard, and the pump. Now, on the mechanically sealed pump, we have motor, coupling, connecting to the pump shaft. Pump shaft, which leads to the external bearings, thrust, and radial. The mechanical seal, and finally, the impeller, all on one shaft. The magnetic drive pump has more components. Again, you have the motor and the coupling, connecting to the drive shaft, which is connected to the outer magnet carrier, which in turn connects magnetically to the inner magnet carrier. So that in turn is connected physically to this driven shaft, the pump shaft, and so to the impeller. Looking at the two rotating assemblies together, these are where the differences lie, the additional components. A second shaft, the outer magnet carrier, and the inner magnet carrier. So why choose a magnetic drive pump? Well, there are, there are two major considerations, environmental friendliness and safety of personnel. Here on the right is a scale of safety, starting here at the bottom with a packed gland pump, which these days would only be used when pumping clean or cleanish water. It doesn't matter much if it leaks. Moving up the scale to less and less risk of le leakage. But first you have a single mechanical seal, which will leak probably only parts per million, but it will be leaking. And if it's, uh, uh, depending on what you're pumping, that might not be acceptable. Then you have two types of double mechanical seal. We have the unpressurized version and the pressurized version. With this one, leakage past the inboard seal will go to a reservoir from where it could possibly leak to atmosphere. In this one, the pressurized mechanical seal, you have from the reservoir, the backup seal, it pushes it into the pump. So any leakage is into the pump, not out to atmosphere, except if you have a seal or bearing failure. Next up the list would be a mag drive, a basic construction pump with no secondary control or secondary containment. And at the top of the scale, we have secondary control and secondary containment, which are similar but subtly different. And I'll come back to that in uh, later slides. Now, 
Well, these are the type of applications where mag drives are actively considered harmful, toxic, flammable, explosive, heat transfer fluids, or expensive fluids. They're considered where maintenance is important, less maintenance, such as unmanned applications. We have um, mag drive pumps, large mag drive pumps on an offshore platform where they'll be left months at a time without any maintenance. You get reduced installation costs compared with the double mechanical seal, largely because you haven't got a seal support system to have to install alongside. And it can cover a wide range of temperatures. And these are the common limitations why you would not use a mag drive pump. Pressure. The higher the pressure, the thicker the containment shell. The thicker the containment shell, the greater the magnetic losses, and so reduced efficiency. Power. There are limits to how much power can be transmitted by the magnets. Anything over 175, 200 kilowatts is a bit of a special. Viscosity. You're okay if you stick within the manufacturer's limits. Too low viscosity can lead to poor lubricating properties, such as hydrogen or methane, for example. Vapor pressure. Mag drive pumps cannot tolerate vapor. Oops. But we'll cover that more in coming slide, slide 36. Solids. Well, narrow flow passages might get blocked, but this isn't a big problem and manufacturers have designs to overcome this constraint, as you'll see in slides 35 and 43. So how does a magnetic drive pump work? Well, these are the big five headliners. And we'll go through them one by one. The magnetic coupling here, the containment shell here in yellow, the internal bearing feed system, and internal bearings here and here, and zero leakage. So as I say, one by one. First, the magnetic coupling. You have the outer magnet carrier, which is here, directly coupled to the electric motor and running in air. Then we have the containment shell, here in blue and here in yellow. We like to be consistent. And then the inner magnet carrier, inner magnet carrier, which is driven by magnetic forces by the outer magnet, outer magnet. Here we see it in cross section. The outer magnets shown in red are dry, running in air, and the inner magnets shown in blue are inside the containment shell, so they're running submerged in the pumped liquid. There are, of course, magnetic losses. Uh, the magnitude of these losses is dependent on several matters. Firstly, thickness. The thickness of the containment shell. Here, this could be, say, a one millimeter thick shell, and so the separation between the magnets is about two millimeters. Here, a thicker shell, one and a half millimeters, the gap would be two and a half millimeters perhaps. And here with a two millimeter thick shell, the gap could be three, three and a half millimeters. The magnetic losses will be greater the greater the gap between the magnets. So we're looking to minimize that. In fact, there are five determining variables influencing the magnetic losses. Magnet size, bigger diameter, greater the losses. Pump speed, 
double the speed, you double the losses. The quantity of magnets. More magnets means more losses, but on the other hand, more magnets means more power transmitted. The magnet gap, which is directly linked to the shell thickness, as we just saw. Bigger the gap, the more the losses. And finally, selection of the shell material. Different materials have different electrical resistivity. The applications engineer who's selecting the pump will be balancing these five um, variables to optimize the selection, technically and commercially. It's a balancing act. And here are the variables, size of magnetic coupling, the pressure, the temperature, the material, and the thickness. Let's illustrate this with an example. Let's assume we are pumping sulfuric acid at 45 degrees centigrade and 10 bar, 145 PSI. We can select a 16 bar pump, which is an entry level ANSI or ISO pump with a 316 Pasteloy C4 hybrid containment shell. I'll say that again, it's 316 stainless and Pasteloy C4 hybrid. And here is that, just to keep you in the picture. This part of the containment shell would be a pastelloy, and this part would be the 316 stainless. So with that selection, everything is in balance. All is good. Now let's assume a condition requires a 32 bar pressure. The balance is upset. We either need to select a thicker shell or change the material of the shell. Here, we've changed the thickness of the shell to one and a half millimeters from one millimeter. We are back in balance. We could equally as well have changed the material of the shell to a different stronger material while keeping the thickness the same. The applications engineer is always playing with all the variables to optimize the selection. Now, selection of the shell materials can have positive and negative impact. For example, 316 stainless and hastaloy the hybrid that we just looked at in the example is the green trace here. So we see it is low cost, which is a strong positive impact. It's middling in strength, but it's high in losses. So that's a negative impact. And it's middling in thickness. If we were to look at in canal and titanium shells, the yellow line, it's very expensive. In fact, current day prices put it nearer to here than to here. So that's a very strong negative, but it's very strong, which is a strong positive impact. Middling for losses, but because of the strength, you can keep it very thin thus minimizing the magnetic losses. And here we have ceramic shells in blue. High in cost, so a strong negative impact. Low in losses, in fact, uh, sorry, low in strength, <laughs> so a strong negative, but very low in losses, in fact, zero losses. So this is a strong positive impact. Then it's high in thickness, so a strong negative again. The magnets are further apart than the metallic fill shells because it's a thicker material, so you cannot transmit as much power. But the power you do transmit is at zero loss. So it's all a balancing act. 
or a juggling act. Moving on to the internal bearing feed system. The internal moving parts are lubricated and cooled by the product you're pumping. It's driven by differential pressure from the pump. It comes out of the pump discharge here behind the impeller at discharge pressure through a self-cleaning filter along the inside of the containment shell, taking away heat from the magnets and back through this drilled hole in the shaft back to the suction side of the impeller. A stream splits off from this main stream at point three and passes over the journal bearings here and here. And then again back to the drilled hole through the shaft and back to the suction side of the impeller. I will show you an animation later that illustrates this beautifully. This graph here is a pressure temperature profile of the liquid as it passes through the pump. We start at suction pressure, of course, and here is the discharge pressure of the pump, which is 0.1 on the flow diagram. The impeller has done work on the, on, on the liquid, getting it to the discharge pressure, so the pressure is high and the temperature has risen as well because you're doing work on the fluid. And now, as it passes through the, through the bearing feed system, it will be getting hotter. This temperature along the bottom here, it's getting hotter. And the pressure will be dropping until it gets back to suction pressure at the back of the impeller. Now, the blue dotted line is the vapor pressure line of the fluid. It is vital that the pressure in the cooling passages does not get too close to vapor pressure line or it will vaporize. Now, this is something that the manufacturer will check and design such that it can never happen under any flow condition, from minimum flow to run out, minimum suction pressure, maximum suction pressure, minimum fluid temperature, or maximum fluid temperature. Now, it's not shown here, but whenever there are solids present in the fluid, we fit a vortex breaker here at point seven. It prevents vortex formation and the abrasion resulting from that. As I said, I will be showing you uh, an animation of this and it'll make it much clearer. Here we see the journal bearing, the true heart of the pump. If this is maintained, it will outlast the impeller. It's typically made of silicon carbide or carbon. There are two bearings, one static here and one rotating here. They are heat shrunk into position and they include lubrication grooves to ensure good flow. The thermal coefficient of expansion difference between a metallic and ceramic component is massive. Metals expand and contract far more and far more quickly than ceramic components. This could be a real... Oh, sorry, I just stopped the screen share, didn't I? Yes. Here we go, we're back going again. So where was I saying? I was saying metals expand and shrink far more and far more quickly than ceramic components. So this can be a real problem 
on startup from cold or when there is a range of temperature conditions. Now this following feature is unique to raw pumping. We use locking springs that preload the bearings, which means that whatever happens as the pump heats up and cools down, these dynamic bearings stay exactly where they're supposed to. Whatever the temperature, minus 130 or plus 350 degrees. And the same applies to this static bearing here. There's an exotic metal alloy spring between the ceramic and metallic parts here. More typically, manufacturers would have a solid spacer in here where we have this uh, spring bellows, which is more limited in temperature range cover. Again, the animation I will show you in a minute illustrates this construction beautifully. So there are three main risks to the bearings operation. Viscosity, poor lubrication, solids, clogging and abrasion, and lack of flow. So how do we deal with these risks? Stay within the manufacturer's limits. You tell them what you need and the manufacturer will design accordingly and give you any constraints that you might need to follow. Finally, just to explain, there is no leakage with this designer pump. The blue parts only are in contact with the fluid. The red parts are completely dry. Moving on, these are the options. We have various available options. They're summarized here in this slide, but with more detail in each of the following slides. So we have secondary control, secondary containment, and I will talk here in a minute about the difference between these two. We have filtration, heating, the inducers, and the vortex and turbulence preventer. So first, secondary control. What happens here is that the steel pump casing, number one, is the containment vessel. And we have a, a lip seal, sorry, here, a lip seal or a dry running seal here. We have a flange leading off to the hazardous drain system. And you would have a pressure switch or level switch or flow switch to detect any leakage should this inner, um, should the containment vessel rupture. It also has a back pumping labyrinth system on the outside of the containment shell. I'll show you that in the animation in a minute. See how I like to build up the anticipation? So the steel casing, number one, and the bearing isolator here will last at least the 24 hours required by API 685. And quite frankly, you're going to shut the pump down well before that. Let's just look at what API 685 says. A secondary containment system to be a combination of devices that in the event of leakage from the primary containment shell or stata liner, confines the pumped liquid within a secondary pressure casing that includes provisions to indicate a failure of the primary containment shell or stata liner. So that's what we're doing in this one. There is the contained secondary pressure casing, with a labyrinth seal, and a drain to the hazardous drains tank with a pressure switch or a level switch or a flow indicator to show that it is leaking. If you've had failure of that. What does API 685 say about secondary containment? 
confinement of the pumped liquid within a secondary pressure casing in the event of failure of the primary containment shell or stator line. So that means a double shell, a secondary containment shell. Each containment shell has to have the same pressure rating and wall thickness. And between the two, you'd have a partial vacuum. And so if you do get failure of the inner can, you'd get a rising in the pressure, which would al allow you to trigger the fact that you've had a failure. So this is what API 685 says, a combination of devices that in the event of leakage from the primary containment shell confines the pumped liquid within the secondary pressure casing. And it will include provisions that indicate a failure of the primary containment shell or stator line. Looking at this, you would say, secondary containment sounds far superior, right? Tick the box on the data sheet. I'll have one of those every time. Well, yes and no. I hesitate at the moment adding this to my list of things that API got wrong, but the jury's still out on this. But there are definitely some areas you would think long and hard about before specifying secondary containment. Some things to think about. API 685 specifies a 40 bar design pressure for both the containment shells. What has that done to your magnet gap? Mm -hmm. Especially if you need ceramic containment shells, what has that done to your losses? The size of the magnets. And if an upset is going to rupture the inner can, might it not rupture the outer can too? Especially if, as frequently happens, the, uh, they're designed for a lower pressure than the inner can which, like I say, for practical reasons, it sometimes is to keep the gap down. And the gap between the inner and secondary shells, you need to keep that to be mi minimal, the minimum possible. And that can be extremely difficult and expensive to manufacture. The gap can easily be 250% that of the single containment shell. And that's all leads to losses. So I would say think long and hard before you select secondary containment over secondary control. This will this steel vessel will last quite long enough to give you time to shut the pump down. It'll last the 24 hours that is a requirement of API 685. API 685 also has this Appendix B, which is a decision matrix for when you should choose between the two. The higher the risk, for example, auto ignition, um, H2S, and very hazardous chemicals, it starts talking about using secondary containment instead of secondary control for slightly lower risks. Next option, the ceramic containment shell. It has zero losses. That's its advantage. But the increased magnet gap means you may need larger or more magnets to transmit the power you need to run the pump. Another option, the mainstream filter. Um, This would be put on the discharge flange of the pump. Solids would be filtered out. It's a self-cleaning filter. And this is where the filtered flow would come into the lubrication system. Heating and cooling jackets. If you're pumping uh, a chemical that is subject to waxing or a hydrocarbon that is subject to waxing, you might well need a steam jacket here, uh, possibly here as well on the intermediate housing. Or if it's a hot chemical, uh, maybe you'll need cooling here. 
Both can be operated independently or in conjunction with each other. We can use clean product injection. That might well be um, filtered and cooled product that is injected in here as a, as a green, and it goes through and back into the pump. And finally, inducers to reduce the NPSH required of the pump. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for, it's movie time. Here is the animation I referred to a um, couple of times already. It's about two minutes long, and I muted the music. Now, here is the first thing that I wanted to show you. Uh, it illustrates the lubrication and cooling flow path through the pump. There we go. Let's look at that again. And again. And the next thing we'll be looking at will be the pre-stressed locking springs to compensate for thermal expansion. Here they are in the axial direction. and in the radial direction. So whatever temperature you're operating at, or change of temperature, this locking spring will compensate and ensure that the bearings are in the perfect position as they should be. Here we go in the radial direction. And finally, this is an outer locking spring that is used whenever we have a ceramic can. This one, again, allows for the fact that the metal parts will expand or contract far more quickly than the ceramic, which probably won't change at all. So this compensates for it and makes sure that we don't get a leak at this point here. Now we're going to look at the um, secondary control. What we're going to see here is a rupture of the containment shell. And we get leakage. And here we see the expeller thread, which acts not only as a labyrinth seal, but the thread acts as a pumping ring, pushing the flow backwards and reducing the leakage. The leakage, much reduced, gets as far as this lip seal. It's a lip seal here. If it were an API pump, it would be a mechanical seal. And it goes from there to the drain. Take it back to the beginning again. There we go, we get the rupture. See the pumping ring pushing it backwards, reducing the amount of flow. The reduced amount comes through here and is stopped by that lip seal from getting to the bearings and escaping out into the, to the atmosphere. And the final 
Go back into that. That was what I was trying to show you. It's the vortex preventer that is fitted in the end of that shaft if there are any going to be any solids in the in the product. And that will uh, ensure that vortices do, don't form and that abrasion uh, does not occur. And this is our byline for this product. Best available technology not impacting our planet planet. So moving on to the features and benefits of a mag drive pump. Now, these are mostly features that are not unique to raw pump and they're sort of generic to any mag drive pump. But there are a couple that are unique to raw pump and, and one of those is this one, the bearing position stability, these locking rings. And the heat dissipating bracket with a thermal break here. That's not unique to raw pump and, but um, not everyone does it on ISO and ANSI pumps. It can be important at uh, higher temperature applications to protect these bearings. This free flow filter here is where the flow comes from the pump through that filter, which is a self-cleaning filter. The impeller would wash away uh, any clogging of that free flow filter before the flow goes in and through through here. We saw that earlier. So these are the, the benefits of a magnetic drive pump. No leakage of product, zero emissions, no mechanical seal or seal support system, Therefore, reduced installation cost, because you haven't got this. You have complete fluid containment, so no leakage of product, zero emissions, and improved operator safety and protection of the environment. That's why you'd be looking at a mag drive pump. And finally, let's look at the industrial standards that are applicable to, uh, to these pumps, the mag drive pumps. These are the API hydraulics that we have available. In fact, there's another one on there, an 8 by 6 by 17, which doesn't show there. I should have put that in. Um, well, these are the API pump sizes, and it's suction, discharge, impeller diameter. And these are the ANSI sizes. Again, the same thing, suction, discharge, and impeller diameter. And these are the hydraulics of the ISO hydraulics. Again, suction, discharge, and um, uh, impeller diameter, this time in millimeters because it's a metric standard. Within each of these pumps, certainly the API pumps, and to a lesser extent, these pumps as well, there can be more than one impeller design, more than one hydraulic. So we might have um, low, medium, and high flow impellers for each of these sizes, thus significantly increasing the number of options that we have available to give you the perfect selection. And these are the three international standards, ASME or ANSI and ISO pumps are both for general purpose process pumps, and they are predominantly dimensional standards, so that any pump from any manufacturer is dimensionally interchangeable with the same size pump from another. API 685 is a spin-off from API 610. So API started from API 610 and adjusted it to suit magnetic drive pumps, thinning out non-applicable um, sections like between bearings and multi-stage pumps and mechanical seals and systems, and adding in sections that are specific to mag drive pumps. And here is a summary of the key mechanical differences between API and ASME and ISO. Pressure rating, API is a 40 bar. All pumps must be rated for 40 bar. ASME, 
18.9 bar, ISO 16 bar. So it's a, a lower pressure standard. API pumps have both case and impeller wearings. ANSI and ISO pumps generally have casing only. It's a centerline mount API for hot applications. ANSI and ISO pumps generally foot mounted. API has no dimensional standard. It's, um, so if you buy a similar, a same size pump from, or a nominally same size pump from two different suppliers, they will not fit on the same base plane. Whereas with ANSI and ISO, it's prescribed and therefore they, anybody's pump will, is interchangeable with anybody else's pump. Testing and inspection within API is mandatory and it's optional within ANSI and ISO. Final slide now, it's looking at the marketplace. Raw Pumpen has been building these pumps since 2012 and we've manufactured 675 pumps in that time. So I looked at the installation list and came up with some interesting statistics. Now, the raw pump and range of pump sizes is very similar to the uh, big players in the market. So FlowServe, Klaus Union, Sundyne, which is HMD, and uh, KSB. So I think these statistics apply across the industry. So I looked at the installation list and I saw that 80% of pumps are less than 10 kilowatts. 90% are less than 20 kilowatts. 7% are between 20 and 50 kilowatts. And 3% are above 50 kilowatts. 10% of pumps are API build. 90% are ANSI or ISO build. And the largest pump we've built to date is 160 kilowatts. Uh, we have one being built that is 200 kilowatts. Well, that concludes the fun for today. Apart from the Q&A, which is coming up in a few moments, I just want to tell you about the next session. Having just covered mag drive sealless pumps, it seems appropriate to cover mechanical seals. So that's what we're going to do. Two weeks from today, Thursday, the 21st of September, the usual times. I'm leaving the meeting open for a little while to allow you to post in the Q&A box. And I'll endeavor to answer those that only need a short answer here and now. Uh, and those that need a fuller answer will be answered uh, within a few days by mail. Anything you think of later, there's the email address to send it to. Our marketing team is standing by to direct your questions or suggestions to the best person to answer them, and they'll be sending you the YouTube recording and a PDF of the presentation, um, as well as the, um, the Q&A from, from this session. Again, if you need a certificate of completion for this short course, here's where to send it. And here, right at the end, as usual, are eight slides about Real Pumpen that remind you of who we are and what we do. They'll be part of the PDF copy of the presentation you get, so you can peruse them at your leisure. So now, on with the Q&A. Let's have a look and see what we have. Yes, we've got a few here, about eight. Uh, Nico van Duvendijk says, can you not make the containment shell longer to accommodate more magnets if the containment shell gets thicker? Or is this even less economic than changing a stronger, thinner material for the shell? It's the balancing thing again. Uh, that is certainly something we will be looking at, uh, uh, balancing the length against the number, against the thickness, um, many, many options. Every time the applications engineer would be looking at that to minimize the technical 
to offer you the best technical and commercial answer. An anonymous attendee has said, is it the case that the secondary pump shaft is floating on the magnetic field and has no bearing? Are there complex controls to maintain the balance on the shaft? No, there, there are bearings, there are journal bearings. There's a, the, um, as maybe I should go back into that. Here we go. Here are the bearings. You have a, a static bearing and you have the rotating bearing here. So there's a close clearance between them and the fluid that is being pumped through is going between those two bearings and maintaining. It's a, like a hydrodynamic bearing. Okay. Um, how does a self-cleaning filter work? Um, well, basically, there's a, a flow of fluid washing over it all the time, just flushing it clear of the solids that are, that are um, accumulating on it. Nathan Little says, what's the maximum power transmission limit for using a mag drive? I'm not sure that there is necessarily a maximum power transmission. The biggest we've done is 160 kilowatts, and we've got one going that's 100, uh, 200 kilowatt. That's probably the limit of um, commercially available uh, magnetic drives. Anonymous attendee says, are the magnets permanent or electromagnetic? Are there temperature sensors to monitor them? What are the expected magnet lifetime? Um, they are permanent magnets. Um, you can fit temperature sensors to, uh, to, to monitor them. Uh, that would monitor particularly if they were increasing in temperature, meaning that there was an interruption to the, um, the um, cooling flow and um, lubrication flow. Uh, I cannot tell you the expected magnet lifetime. I'll have to check on that and get back to you in writing. Um, another anonymous attendee, we've got a lot of those. How do magnetic pumps compare in total efficiency versus, say, mechanical seals? Um, depends on the material that you've selected. For example, I, I, I told you the um, with the ceramic um, shells, you have zero losses. So with that case, it would be as efficient as a, um, a, a, as a mechanically sealed pump. Our anonymous attendee has said again, why aren't vertical suspended pumps with mag drive not common, such as VS6? Most seems to be horizontal or inline vertical. Well, you did see uh, that the majority of the pumps are less than 30 kilowatts in the region of you know, 20 kilowatts. Now, most VS6s um, that, that I have sold over the years have been much higher powers than that. But there's no reason why you couldn't have um, a, a VS6 pump certain smaller VS6 pumps uh, designed as mag drive that just hasn't really been the demand for them. It tends to be for the vast majority of them is for ANSI or ISO pumps. You saw 90% of the pumps, the demand has been for ANSI or ISO pumps. Only 10% of the demand has been in the last 10 years for API pumps. Um, Mr. Anonymous says again, if solids are not an issue, how much and how thick could solids be handled? Um, on one of the slides, I did show, I think it's up to 5% and maybe I need to look at it. Hold on a second. No, I can't immediately find it. Uh, I, I'll, um, I'll give it to you in writing, but it was on one of the earlier slides where we uh, said what what are the constraints, and it showed the um, the, the, the maximum and solid size that we, we can handle. Nico van Duvendijk says, did you mention that for an API pump design, a mechanical seal is required on the driving shelf in case of failure on the shell? Um, okay, if you have secondary containment, you need some sort of seal to stop the escaped fluid 
passing through the bearings and out to atmosphere. Now, if that's an ISO pump or an ANSI pump, it's okay to use a lip seal for that. Um, API 685 doesn't allow uh, a lip seal there, so it would have to be like a dry running gas seal um, as often used on um, mechanically sealed pumps as a, as a backup seal. Anonymous attendee again says, is the market demand or interest for mag drives increasing a lot or just relatively steady? I think there is a general increase, particularly in Europe, um, because of concern for the environment. So certainly something that we are pushing, um, environmental concerns. Uh, the anonymous attendee asks, what are the typical percent losses or range for magnet losses? It's that's how long is a piece of string? Uh, it, it, there are five um, things to balance there. Uh, so there's no easy answer to that. And that's something that the applications engineer would be looking at every time. What is the maximum pumping pressure? 98 gallons a minute with 4,575 feet of TDH. Would you recommend an API 685 pump, the pumping LPG? Uh, no, you, I think you are well out of that. 4,575 feet of TDH is way high pressure for um, the, that is a barrel pump with a plan 53, um, without doubt. In fact, it could even be a positive displacement pump at that sort of head, 4,575 feet. Mr. Anonymous attendee says he loves my vest and tie. Hello. <laughs> As usual, always stylish. Well, thank you very much. I try my best. <laughs> um, he says, is the total owning cost of a magnetic pump lower than a mechanical seal version? Um, that would be the balance that you're looking to go. You might pay a little bit more for the pump. Not always, because let's have a look. If you've got a fairly small pump, and you're comparing a mechanically sealed pump with, an, uh, with an, um, a mag drive pump, the mechanically sealed pump has probably got a plan 53 system. So that would be as a proportion of the overall cost of, uh, of the installation, that could be a big part. Whereas a small um, mag drive pump has no cooling, no um, seal system to have to install. So therefore the cost comes comes down in that sense. It's a balance. It's a balance again, as all these things, so many things you need to look at. Uh, you also need to look at the overall cost of ownership, the less maintenance perhaps of uh, uh, a mag drive pump compared with a mechanically sealed pump. Many, many things you need to look at. Uh, do API 685 pumps have a closed, close couple design or only with separate bearing assembly? design is available. Um, it's the, it is the same. The internal bearings are what um, the pump runs on. The external bearings are just um, radial bearings um, taking the weight only of the outer magnet carrier. They're not taking any thrust, not taking any radial loads. Are there concerns with ferrous solids building up on the magnet areas, such as rust from carbon steel piping? How to prevent this issue? Um, that's above my pay grade. I don't know how to answer that one. I'll get an answer from our experts and get that back to you. David Alcorn says, would overhead high voltage AC power lines interfere magnetically with the pump operation? I'll have to take advice on that as well. I don't know. Our anonymous attendee says, you mentioned that depending on the material of the shell, the magnetic losses can be even zero. In that case, pump efficiency of the mag drive version would be better than the one having the mechanical friction loss. Is that right? Um, yeah, that would be right, yeah. I've just been accused of looking like a waiter because of my vest and tie. Can't believe it, can't believe it. What industry has more mag pumps? 
I think you'll find it's the chemical industry because you're taught, you're pumping um, some very hazardous chemicals and, uh, and very valuable chemicals in many cases. So that's where a lot of the um, mag drive pumps are, are installed, not so much in the process industries. What is the point of having two containment shells if they're both designed for the same pressure? Well, they have to be designed for the same pressure. I mean, if the inner one is designed for 40 bar and it gives, the outer one also needs to be 40 bar. It's now seeing all the pressure. However, I think that sometimes they do play games with, uh, with, with this a little bit because maybe the inner one needs to be needs to be by API 685, needs to be designed for 40 bar, but in fact the pump is only seeing 20 bar. So they say, well, okay, let's have two 20 bar um shells on there. So because that's the worst that could happen. Um, but that wouldn't actually comply with API 685. It would be a uh, a waiver on that. Sometimes ferrite magnets use plastic binders, and these binders can warp. Could this cause the magnets to lose their shape and therefore break our pump? Um, I don't know. Um, I'm sure it isn't the case. Um, we've designed a Rolls Royce of a pump here, a Cadillac of a pump, um, but I will get a proper answer to you for that question. Well, that appears to be all the questions for the moment. Um, in which case, it just remains for me to say um, thank you for attending today. It's six o'clock, which means it's beer o'clock, and I'll be straight downstairs to uh, to uncork myself one. Thank you for attending today. I enjoyed preparing and presenting it. I hope you found it useful. See you back again in two weeks when we'll talk about mechanical seals. Take care. Bye-bye.